Happy Palm Sunday to everyone. It's good to see you in church this morning. Before we get started, we would like to take some time for a few announcements. So, are there any announcements that need to be made? Bill? Hey, just a reminder, of course, everybody knows next Sunday is Easter and we're going to have the sunrise service. But after the sunrise service, we're going to have an Easter feast back there in the back. We're going to have eggs, we're going to have sausage, biscuits, a sausage gravy, uh, grits. So it's cool, and orange juice. So once the service is over, come to the back, and the men's fellowship is going to serve you and take care of you. Just come back and just enjoy it, eat all you want. We're going to have plenty. So it's going to be an Easter feast. So. <laughs> Because the men's going to prepare it. <laughs> I look forward to it. That sounds like a man's kind of meal, doesn't it? Yeah. What happened to the croissants and the fruit? Is that, that sort of got off the menu. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. No, I'm good with it. Any other announcements? Anybody? Oh, yes. Kathy in the back and then Sandy in the front. The bus will be leaving at 5.30 tonight for the presentation of Once Upon a Tree in Jamestown. It's a beautiful presentation. Please come. All right. Thank you. Sandy? If y'all will remember, a couple weeks ago, I spoke to you about us getting the children's ministry um, restarted after COVID, and I asked you to prayerfully consider joining us. And at the end of the service, eight people had prayerfully considered it already and signed up. And praise God. And we are starting a regular children's church every Sunday, the Sunday after Easter. So those of you that prayerfully considered and haven't turned your name in to me yet, <laughs> when these other children start coming, we're going to need you. So you be getting ready, okay, because we're going to need you. And those wonderful people that are volunteering to help jumpstart it, uh, we're having our training for Safe Sanctuary immediately after the service in the um, adult Sunday school class. And if you get there quickly, we'll get out quickly. Thank you. Thank you, Sandy. Let me just say one thing before we go any further. I want to thank Jamie and, uh, and all those volunteers yesterday that had the Easter egg hunt. I think we had close to 30 children here, which was really, really wonderful. And uh, we, we even had, a, a, we even had a, a about four or five teenagers show up for the first time. So it was really, really wonderful to see. It was an exciting time. And I want to thank everybody for doing all the hard work to prepare for that. God bless you. Keep up the good work. Yes. Oh, is that what you were going to say? Well, Christy wants to embellish on what I just said. And, uh, or just give me an amen. I don't know. Yeah, there you go. All right, any other announcements this morning? Anyone? Oh, Christy, go ahead. I'm just... Okay. So we do, for the children's church, we will have snacks and like juice or water for them. So don't worry, you know, they'll have a little activities and then have a little snack that they'll have as well. So with the number of kids that were here yesterday, prayerfully consider and give your name to Sandy. Yeah, and you know what really, it really amped up after they got those eggs and opened them up and started getting into that sugar. Whoa, yeah. Katie bar the door, the party's on. But, uh, anyone else? All right, if not, then Bill is going to pray for our service. Good Palm Sunday morning, everyone. It's so good, good to see you out on this beautiful day. Out of reverence to our Lord and Savior, let us bow our heads, if you will. Dear God, because we love you, we're gathered to praise and worship. We ask for the joy in experience in the presence of your Holy Spirit. Be with Pastor Steve as he brings us a message of hope and salvation through the scripture. And be with our choir, Linda, Judy, as they complement this service through beautiful music. 
how blessed we are. And let us remember to allow our Christian lights to shine brightly and to never, ever forget whose we are. Amen. 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 Thank you so much, Bill. At this time, let's all stand and greet one another and tell everybody it's good to see you in church. Then remain standing for our first hymn. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I'm going to be doing it Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, but if you want to, uh, you know, oh, my, hold on. Thank you, church. I'd like to give you an opportunity now for those of you that would like to lift up somebody for prayer this morning. Are there any prayer requests? Here we got some hands right here. Right here on your left, Winford. Oh, you got one? Oh, no. Hold on. Yeah, uh, yesterday my grandkids came up and we had the Easter thing at the resort or I'd have been over here. But um, afterwards my granddaughter got sick and was running like 103 temperature and uh, they took her to the emergency room, was there four hours and they still didn't see a doctor, and, but they did get the fever down. But now it's, this morning my daughter said that her fever was back up to 102 so they're probably gonna take her to urgent care. So if y'all pray for her, please. Thank absolutely, you. absolutely. Sorry to hear that. Uh, over here. Oh, me? Uh, I, I was looking back. No, we're working our way up to you. My aunt Law, uh, I'm sorry, I'm going to cry, was just put into hospice this morning with heart failure. So if you could please pray for her. Yes. I'd appreciate it. Absolutely. And we pray for you also. Um, yes, I would like for you all to keep. Um, the Hudson family in your prayers, thoughts and prayers. Um, Greg and I have known the Hudson family for most of our life. Greg, you probably have known them a little bit longer, uh, living right down the road from them. But um, Greg's, uh, our good high school friend, a dear friend from high school, Tony Hudson, called last night and his brother um, had committed suicide the night before. 
Um, that is Jackie Hudson, that was his name, and his wife, Chloe. Um, Jackie was a Christian, and he, we think he was good with God. Uh, he just wasn't good with himself, I guess. So um, please keep that family in your prayers. Thank you. I'm so sorry to hear that. Yes. A friend of Tim and mine, Larry Cox, he is trying to recover from COVID. And if y'all will keep him in your prayers. And also a friend of Tim's that has, is battling cancer. Um, she, her name is Carol Pfeiffer. And also Gary Curry is battling cancer. If y'all will keep him in your prayers. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for that. We will. We'll be praying for them. Judy. My mom wants to thank everybody for their prayers and for the plants that have been brought to her. Just continue to keep her in your prayers. Uh, for those of you that may not know, she was attacked by a big German shepherd last Monday. And uh, she's pretty down right now. Let's be in prayer for Dottie. Eva? I'm praying for our son-in-law, and then I got a praise. I got my grandson here from Germany, and he spends the week with us, and then he's going to fly to Boston, to Boston and he's going to be in the Maritime, and he fly back home. So y'all just going to pray for him so he don't going to come up with COVID when he have to fly to Boston. So pray for him. Thank you. Yeah. Have they fed you grits yet? Yes, there you go. There you go. Mark. Uh, Carol and I have some dear friends in the St. Louis area. We've known them for 48 years, and we got word this week that Frank passed away this past Monday. Uh, he had struggled with extreme pain for a number of years. That family has been through a lot, so keep them in your prayers. Okay, thank you. Yes, Kathy. Pray for R.P. and Keith to continue to heal after yes. their surgeries this week. Yeah. Yes, Reba. I want to praise, give a praise to God for Miss Pat. She walked 70 feet down the hall with the help of her walker and her therapist. And she has a roommate now that she can care for and company in that room with other Christians. So she seemed to be up that day. And I'm so glad God's providing her needs. And Amen. I thank God today. Yes, thank you, Reba. Good morning to you, Pat. Yes, Joni. I just, I just want to thank everyone who's been praying for our family. Um, we got a couple of really good reports this week from different oncologists for things that were going on. And we're just blessed and we're thankful for all your prayers. Thank you. Thank you, Joni. Anyone else? Linda? We have many to pray for, but especially in the choir, but as today, particularly for Kendall. Yes, for Kendall. In the back, Pete. Yeah, let's keep uh, Bobby Smith in our prayers. He's got some bad news. Okay, we'll be praying for Bob. I was thinking about him the other day. Um, let's uh, also keep Dave and Dee Mahoney in our prayers. Uh, let's lift up uh, for the Lord to provide everything that they need right now uh, in his hopeful recovery. Yes, Terry. I'd like y'all to remember my cousin, Phil. The, some of you know the church has helped him out financially a few times. Right. He's, he's had a stroke in the past, and, and it just has affected him mentally. And the family's involved, all my cousins and stuff, and he's going to have to give up his house. He's just not mentally able to pay the bills and keep up with things and, and um, he's, he's come to terms with that but it's a hard time and um, we do think we have a, a, a somebody that would buy his house and, and repair it and flip it but uh, we're looking for the section 8 or whatever they're doing with the county and y'all just pray that all it goes through it's, it's a rough time he's been there 30 years and it's a pride oh. thing to have to walk away from your house but he just can't look after himself or the house anymore uh, that's so sad I'm sorry to hear that Yes, Kathy. I want to thank you for the prayers for my friend, co-worker's husband. Um, he's still in the hospital. He did make great strides, and they thought he was going to rehab. But right now, 
he's had a setback in the fact that his wife is having to take turns to stay with him 12 hours at a time. They have to wake him up every hour and a half to two hours to make sure that he wakes up. So if you'll keep um, Terry and Jeff in your prayers, I would appreciate it. Okay. Thank you, Kathy. It's good to see you, Dave Lookadoo in the choir this morning, isn't it? Wonderful. It's good to have him back. What he doesn't know is I'm going to call him the preach here in just a minute. I uh, thought I'd throw that little surprise at you. So, anyone else? All right, if not, let's all bow our heads and let's pray this morning. Gracious and loving God, we thank you for the beautiful morning that you have given us. We thank you, Lord, for all your creation and all that it reminds us of your presence and your love for us and the majesty and the power that you have. We thank you, Lord, that we can come here and we can worship freely in our church and not live in fear of oppression or persecution for doing so. We pray, O oh God, for those Christians all over the world that are struggling that are under the thumb of oppression and persecution. We pray for those Christians in Ukraine who are suffering such great suffering right now, for those who are grieving because they've lost loved ones. Lord, we just pray, O oh God, for an end to this terrible, inhumane war, that it will come to an end. We pray, O oh Lord, for our leaders throughout the world. Their decisions will shape our direction as we move forward, and we pray, O oh God, that they will, will fall to their knees and seek your will for our country and for the other countries of the world. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can come into this holy season and we can look at ourselves and we can see where we are in our own pilgrimage, our own journey of faith. We're all at different places, but yet we are all under grace and your mercy. Lord, we pray for the sick that have been mentioned by name, for those, Lord, that we are thinking of in our hearts. We lift them up also. We thank you, Lord, for all the many ways that you bless us and now in the next few minutes that we spend together, O oh Holy Spirit, we welcome you into this place. We call upon you to come and to move in our midst, to draw us close to your word and our understanding, that our hearts and the doors of our hearts will open wide for your way and your truth and your life. We give you th thanks and we praise your holy name as we lift up this prayer this morning, in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus, amen. I'd like to ask our ushers if they would come forward and receive his tithes and our offerings this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we have an opportunity to give our gifts to you and to your church. We pray, O oh Lord, for the furthering of your kingdom in our community and that these offerings will be used to do your good work and touch the lives of others. We are blessed, Lord, to give, and we give you thanks for the opportunity. In Jesus' name, amen. Everywhere he went, crowds gathered, longing to be near him. Never was this more evident 
that on the week before his death, as he came riding into Jerusalem on a young donkey, the young and the old rushed to line the streets, waving palm branches and cheering, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. This morning, our scripture will come out of the Gospel of John, chapter 12, beginning at verse 9. We're going to read through verse 19.
When the great crowd of the Jews learned that he was there, they came not only because of Jesus, but also to see Lazarus, who he had raised from the dead. So the chief priests planned to put Lazarus to death as well. Since it was on account of him that many of the Jews were deserting and were believing in Jesus. The next day, the great crowd that had come to the festival heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and they went to him shouting, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. And Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it as it is written, do not be afraid, the daughter of Zion. Look, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first. But when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written of him and had been done to him. So the crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to testify. It was also because they heard that he had performed this sign that the crowd went to meet him. The Pharisees then said to one another, You see, you can do nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. And so is the reading of God's holy word this morning. You know, the story of the triumphal entry into Jerusalem is a beautiful story, and it's also a prophesied story. If you look into the Psalm 118, and you see in verses 25 and 26, it tells us, Save us, we beseech you. Give us success. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. See, the word Hosanna actually means to save. It is a word that indicated we are in need of salvation. The world at that time was in need of it, and so are we in need of it still today. If you look in Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9, you will see, Rejoice greatly, O daughter Zion! Shout aloud, O daughter Jerusalem! Lo, your king comes to you, triumphant and victorious. Is he, he is humble and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. So that prophetic word became a living testimony of what was happening at the time. Let's sort of look at this whole thing just for a minute. Let's back up a little bit. Because right now, in the midst of a very turbulent time, there is also a time of expectation and hope that has been birthed. It was birthed in the ministry of Jesus. His life had reflected God's love for the people. He made himself accessible to the people. He was very touchable. So he wasn't this God that was far, far away that you couldn't touch. He was one that was compassionate and kind, one that had been healing the sick, giving sight to the blind, one who had had taken out the evil out of those who were demonically uh, filled with demons. And then what did he do is he raised a man from the dead, Lazarus. You know the story of Lazarus. And so Jesus then proclaiming, I am the resurrection and I am the life, right there with his sisters. And so I'm telling you folks, that single miracle of Lazarus raising from the dead ignited what had already begun, this major transformation taking place in and throughout that whole region. The Pharisees are very threatened by this. The Pharisees are sitting there trying to figure out how do we contain this man? How do we deal with him? How do we we take the eyes of the people off of him and put back on where they need to be, the temple and the authority of the temple, which is us? Caiaphas had gotten to the point of desperation. So he was going to plot to kill Jesus. And not only Jesus, as you saw this morning in the scripture, it tells us he also wanted to kill Lazarus. He was a great threat too. He was a man that really had been dead four days and Jesus rose him from the dead. So people are all coming together at this specific time 
with this hope in their hearts. Now they had been taught all their life, most of these Jewish people, that when the Messiah came, there would be a time in which he would ride in to Jerusalem on the back of a colt. So what did Jesus do? He rides in to Jerusalem on the back of a colt. Now there should have been other options, and I'm sure that his disciples are thinking of the other options. Let me explain what I mean. For Jesus to go into Jerusalem was dangerous. It was not something that was a safe haven for him. In fact, he would have been better off going maybe to Galilee or Nazareth or some wilderness area and just hiding out. He had enough people that could have hidden him from the wrath of Caiaphas, the high priest. And so I, I, I imagine that if I'm one of the twelve, let's say, for instance, if I were John, the beloved John who loved Jesus so much, and I can imagine in my head that he pulls Jesus aside and he says, Lord, I, I, I'm not asking much out of you. I'm just asking one thing. I will do anything that you ask me to do. And it will be an honor and a privilege to do it. He says, but the one thing I'm asking that you do is please, if you would, don't go to Jerusalem. This is not going to end well. You are the Messiah. You are the resurrection and the life. You are the Savior of the world. And I adore you and I love you. And as a friend, please let me, let me cover your back. I'm trying to help you. There's just no way this is going to end well. And right now, we are excited. The people are excited. The people are wanting the Messiah to come. They're primed and ready to greet you. But there are those in Jerusalem, I'm, I'm scared, are going to, to pull you out of the crowd and take you away. And we just can't have this happen. It will ruin everything that we have believed in and hoped in and trusted all our life. We've been taught how are we going to greet the Messiah. Lazarus shouldn't be going either. So if you would, if you too would maybe go to his house and stay with Mary and Martha and be protected. And Christ just absolutely rejected that. Now, I don't know this. The Bible doesn't actually tell this story, but I'm trying to put myself in John's shoes, or sandals, should I say. I'm trying to sort of try to think like the disciples, like the apostles. And the apostles were believing more now than they had ever believed. But they still had their questions, and they still had their doubts. You've got to remember... These were human beings. These were men. Their expectation of what was or should be or could be was like most other people that had been taught that the Messiah will come riding in triumphantly. We will crown him king. We will kick out Herod. We're going to get rid of Caesar. And we're going to control our own path now. God is going to bless, bless uh, Zion again. We're going to be back and good with God. And the Messiah will lead us. And this is exciting if you think about it. I mean, this is epic story. This is made for Hollywood. This is the, the, the really brave king that comes riding in on a white horse. And unfortunately, it wasn't a white horse. It was a donkey of all things. But, you know, well, yeah, let's not split hairs. But he's going to come in, and you know, I've never seen Caiaphas and the Pharisees as upset as I do now. And so, brothers, sisters, we got to watch Jesus back. He is determined to go to Jerusalem. He's already, already been sought after. If you remember some of the devotionals I read this week, you'll see that they attacked him. They picked up stones to stone him. And he had to slip away. He was in hiding, actually, before he went to Jerusalem. Because he was sought after. So the last thing in the world that Christ really needed to do 
so that he wouldn't be pulled out and taken away and either put in prison or maybe even killed, is go where the enemy was. So I, I'm sure that maybe his disciples, maybe they, they discussed this with him. I, I'm just assuming. I, I could be wrong. I would have. I would have done that. That's, that's exactly what I just said. No, nah, that's not a good idea. Maybe another day, but not now. Man, the temperature is up. Caiaphas is ticked, and he's coming after you. Let's just sort of hide out a while. Let this thing cool down. Well, Jesus absolutely refused. In fact, he tells them, look, I want you to go, and there's going to be a man. He's going to have this little donkey that's never been ridden on before, and all I want you to do is ask for it, and he's going to give it to you. <laughs> and say, okay, all right, if that's what you want us to do. Well, at that point, they, they knew to trust Jesus for those types of things. They had seen him time and again work miracles. I mean, for goodness sake, folks, this is the same man that took a basket of a few pieces of bread and a couple of fish and fed 5,000 people. Now, I'm not going to doubt any possibilities that this man can do, provide a donkey. For Christ comes riding in. The people had their palms, to, said they took palm leaves, and also they, people, they took clothing, some of their clothing, and they laid it down at his feet as he was coming in, riding on that little cult. And they were singing, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest heaven. The day of liberation has arrived. You can't help but get excited. This is a triumphal entry. It's not a defeated entry. This is the king. We are taking our rightful place again. And you're praising God for it. But the story just doesn't take the right turn. The, the, the ending is not what anybody expected or wanted. No more than you would. It would be like if you were called by God, you heard the voice of God. Maybe you had a dream. Maybe you were visited by an angel and said, look, I want you to go and do this. And they didn't tell you everything. And you said, oh my goodness, I, I, I can't resist. There must be something wonderful waiting. And you get there and find out it's a prison door. Or you get there and find out there are people that are going to chastise you, yell at you, curse you. You say, Lord, did you say turn left or turn right? I feel like I turned the wrong way. What's going on here? This is not what I expected. His disciples could not grasp him taking such a risk to go into Jerusalem. But they followed anyway. And i got to admit, they got called up just like everybody else. You know, in that, on that street that he was riding through uh, town, there had to be those people that were just sort of, what's going on there downtown? And they just went to go check it out. You know, those are the ones that are seeking because they're curious. You know, we have people today, they seek about God, they look for God, you know, they're just a little curious. Not really committed to anything. They just sort of see God as, if He is real, He's far away and we'll never truly understand, but... This prophet really has my interest up, so I might go and listen to what he has to say. Well, what's the big crowd all about? You know, we all love parades, don't we? How many like a parade? Oh, I used to love parades. I don't remember, it was just a little bitty mountain town in East Tennessee a long time ago, and I was just a little bitty short guy. I still am. <laughs> I told Rena, I said, you know what? My pants keep dragging. I think I've shrunk. And, and I, I don't know how many inches I've dropped, but I am going in the wrong direction. You know, all my life I've been short. Now, instead of growing, I'm getting shorter. What the heck is all that about? Oh, well, we all know, don't we? You just won't say it. You're too kind. Now I lost my track. I went down. A, I see, that's what happens when you go down a rabbit hole. You just can't find your way out, you know. So anyway, here's Christ riding down through town. I'm going to get back on the track here in a minute. You watch. Just watch. 
And the expectation really was a great celebration. And I would have, folks, if I were there, if I'd been there, I'd have been right alongside of them. Oh, but I, I don't remember now. I was a little bitty fella in East Tennessee. <laughs> Whoa, yeah. There we go. And I remember I couldn't see the parade because I was so short I couldn't. I was looking through the legs of people, you know, <laughs> trying to see Santa Claus. And, and there's this big tall fella right in front of me. He didn't know me. He saw me back there trying to look through, and he grabbed a hold of me. Hey, come here, boy. Let me help you out. He put me on his shoulders, and I went, all right. <laughs> yeah, this is all right. I can see everybody. Oh, there's Santa Claus. <laughs> now, we all like a parade. There's something exciting about it. But this was more than just excitement. They had heard about Lazarus. Remember, they were really intrigued with him, and people wanted to meet him. They wanted to hear his, his end of the story. How, how did you feel when you were dead? And then rose from the dead. Anyhow, he's riding through town, and there's this great prophetic word that has been fulfilled. Christ always fulfilled the scripture, if you notice, throughout his entire life. And then you remember what he says, I didn't come to do away with the law. I came to fulfill the law. So we have the hope of salvation has now come into the town. Now, they're not thinking about a spiritual salvation, folks. I don't believe that. Maybe a few. But I think the majority of them were thinking about a liberation, a return to their faithfulness in God, and to claim their rightful place as a nation, not held in slavery of Caesar or persecution of Herod. They had found a place where they could finally be set free of this terrible thing that had been going on for years. It was probably ever since the Maccabean Revolt, maybe 300 years of oppression. And they had all been passing down generation to generation the hope of the Messiah. And now he's here. You can see why they'd be so happy. Those same people in just a week will turn on him. See, we're like that a lot of times with our relationship with God. We like to control God more than allow God control us. We want to tell God what the rules are in our life. We want to tell God, okay, Lord, I'm going to follow you if. And so what we end up doing is we will split hairs and find little scriptures in the Bible and we will paste them together to defend our argument of what we believe. And then we want God to rubber stamp it. That way, if I have a sin in my life that I don't want to get rid of, even though I say I'm going to get rid of it, but I never do anything about it, if I have that sin in my life, then I can manipulate the Bible to be in my favor. That way, I can live my life however the heck I please, but I'm not willing to surrender anything. I just want God to agree with me. A lot of people do this. We manipulate the truth, and we create our own theology and our own philosophy. That way, when I die, I'm going to heaven, and I can't wait till I get there. Oh boy, I'm going to heaven. Like I told a Bible study group the other night, Wednesday night, yeah, I'm going to ride my Harley right into heaven. And I'm going to hang out with Jesus. I'm going to, I'm going to take him a coat, a leather coat. I'm going to let, it's going to have Harley written right on it. I guarantee you if Jesus walked, I've heard this one before, if Jesus was on the earth today, he would, he would ride a Harley. You haven't heard that? Where have y'all been? Y'all are way out in the country, something like me. You need to get out. You know, we have this idea, and we do it, folks. And, you know, the sad part about it is we never want to admit it because it sounds pretty doggone arrogant, doesn't it? It is arrogant, but it's human. Humanity does this. And if you don't think that God doesn't know we do this, then you really don't believe in God anyway. 
If you don't believe that God can look out beyond the facade that you're putting forth and the lie that you're living, come on. He created you. He knows you better than you know yourself. And so what we need to do is stop playing games with our Lord and humble ourselves to find true and lasting peace. That's what we're seeking after, folks. More than a kingdom on this earth, we've tried that and it hasn't worked out. There's too many competing for the same thing and they're vicious at the top. No, we, we really and truly, I think, most of us want to find a, rest of, a resting peace. We want Jesus to triumphantly ride into our hearts and change us and change our direction. We want a miracle. We're like Lazarus laying in a, in a grave and we're saying, Lord, raise me from this death that I have created in my own life. I need to know there is hope. You know, just two chapters over from where we're reading this morning, Jesus says this in John 14. Let not your hearts be troubled. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place, I will come again and I will take you to myself. Children, you're trying to find the truth. You're trying to find peace. You're trying to find joy. You want this triumphant change in your life. You want things to change. But you're not willing to trust the one that can change it. You're trying to manipulate God. Stop doing that. It's not going to work. You're going to lie to yourself to your grave. That's called cheap grace. We control everything. What we, we need to do is stop imposing our will on God and realize that we need to be receiving from Him what we need to do to change instead of telling Him what we'll do to change. This is one of the problems that we're having with the Bible and a lot of the conflicts we have in the church today is that what we're doing is we're going into the Bible and we're picking those verses we like and then we're creating a whole paradigm and narrative around those verses so we can justify living in sin. That's exactly what we're doing. But what we need to be doing is allowing the Bible to speak to us. Amen. That it makes the boundaries. It tells us how. That the words of Jesus are the ones that we're embracing, not our own really clever little theologies that we have put together so we can justify being disobedient and receiving all the wonderful benefits of believing in God and trusting Jesus. Let not your hearts be troubled. I know, you're tr I know your heart's troubled. Some of you, your hearts are troubled. And the reason is because even now, as I speak to you, it bothers you. You're struggling because you know that I'm speaking truth. And I'm speaking to you. I don't know who you are. God didn't tell me before you got here. Oh, yeah. Third person on the right side. Go after him. No. Doesn't work like that. But the Holy Spirit has a way of getting your attention if you will just listen. And Christ desires to ride into your life triumphantly. Now don't impose your own understanding of that. That's what the people in Jerusalem were doing. That's why they turned on him. He did the opposite. He went in to suffer and to die. That, did, that makes no sense whatsoever. How do you conquer a nation by dying by the sword? How do you do that? That doesn't make sense. That's a defeat. It's like what we think. When we die, it, that's the end. That's a defeat. We will fight for our right to live as long as we can. Maybe get a little face work done on the way. A little tuck here. A little tuck there. Make us look younger. 
Well, God, I got news for you. You might look younger, but you're not. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I mean, I hate breaking that to you. I really do. I know it hurts. Well, I'm only as old as I feel. Is that right? Well, I'm about 120. <laughs> if that's the case, boy, y'all go ahead and order the flowers. My funeral's coming up. No, what it is, is we've got, my friend, listen to me. I know this from personal experience. I've got to stop imposing what I want God to do for me on my terms. And I need to realize that what did Jesus say when Thomas said, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? And what did Jesus say? You know it, you can quote it. I am the way, the truth, and the life. See, Jesus Christ is the way. He is the truth. He is the source of all life, eternal life. And He wants to give that to you and me. He desires, He wants to do it so badly that He was willing to be obedient even to death on a tree. To take our sins away. Listen, people. Listen to what i got to say. This isn't just, oh, Jesus was crucified, He rose again, third day, i got it, preach. No. Jesus gave Himself. He took the ugliness in your life, the sins that you're guilty of, the things that you've thought, the things that you've done, all those things that you would never tell anyone, that you've hidden for years. Christ knows it because He took it on that tree. And He bled real blood. And He wants to wash your soul clean. He wants to make you whole. He wants to become that triumphal King in your heart. He stands at the door and He knocks. And He says, child, let me in. And what you've been doing is locking the door. Or you're just not even taking the energy to turn the latch to let Him in. That's all you can do. You can't save yourself. You can't be holy enough. And you certainly are not going to fool God. What you do is you go on bended knee. And you say, Lord, I messed up. And I don't, I'll be honest, Lord, I don't even know how to make it right. I'm so far away from you. I don't even know where to begin. How do I make this right? And he says, give it to me. My burden is light. I can take it. I will take it from you. Remember, I'm the one that raised Lazarus from the dead. I'm the one that gave a blind man sight. I'm the one that changed a woman's heart and life after years of an issue with blood. I am the one. I have the truth, and I am the way. And if you will trust me, you will have life, eternal life. And what I love about let not your hearts be troubled is he's telling them, I am going to go and I'm going to prepare something for you. It's not like we just flip into eternity one day and we just learn on the fly. And maybe God will let us sort of stay in a closet if we're good enough, you know. Or just stand in the corner and wait our turn. He says, I'm going to go and I'm going to make preparation for you. Amen. And I can't even... <laughs> Why would he do that? I don't deserve anything like that. I mean, he's thought this thing through. He actually knows what will bless you the most. And he's going to go and prepare it. He knows what you need the most. And he's getting ready for you. So when you go through the trial of sickness and your body dies and your spirit is raised up, you've got a home in heaven. Hallelujah. Isn't that something? Can I get an amen from one or two? Yeah. That, I mean, that is, that is an amazing thing. Think about it. God loves you that much that He took your sins through His Son on the cross. He took the abuse of Satan and his lies and his deceit. 
He suffered a physical terrible death. On Good Friday, I'm going to tell you about that. And it is awful what he went through. But he rose again the third day. Hallelujah. You know the old saying, it's Friday but Sunday's coming? My friends, I promise you, the resurrection is where the victory is. The resurrection is he defeated death. He defeated the enemy. And he wants to give it all to you. Are you willing to let him ride triumphantly into your heart today? Or are you going to walk out of here again and you're going to run away and try to manipulate God from here on out? Aren't you getting a little weary? How many are just getting weary? Getting tired? Lord, I've been playing games with you and I need to be honest with you this morning. I need to be honest. For the first time in a long time, I need to call things the way they really are. I'm a mess. I'm just a mess. And I've done it to myself. I really need you and I need your help. I can't do it and I'm tired of trying. See, you're at a place right now where things can really go from bad to better if you'll make this right step. And that's to bend your knee and say, Jesus, I'm lost. I admit it. I'm sorry that I have blasphemed your name. I'm sorry that I've lived in rebellion. I'm sorry that I've lied to you and to myself. So today I'm going to be honest. I'm going to call it the way it really is. And I'm going to open the door of my heart and I'm going to invite you in. And I will never look back. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, you have blessed us in many ways so far in our life. You watched over us at times that we didn't deserve it. You kept us safe from our own stupidity. Lord, you have put us in a place right now, today, where we can be honest finally, where we can find the way and the truth and we can find life. And it won't be anything that we can do ourselves other than open a door. Just open the door and invite you in. We want a relationship with the Son of God. We want you to call us by our first name. We want to walk with you from this day forth. And Lord, we have a lot of obstacles to overcome in our life, but we need to start, and we need to start now. We've got to stop running. We've got to stop making up excuses. And let's be real and truthful for the first time maybe in a long time. Heavenly Father, ride triumphantly into our hearts today. Change us. Set us free of sin and death. Set us free of living in fear. And let us trust you for all things. And we pray that in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Let's all stand and we're going to sing together, O oh, Master, let me walk with thee. If you need to come and pray this morning, the altar is open and Jesus is calling your name.
Let us go forth in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit and serve the risen Lord in these days ahead. And until we meet again, may the Lord bless you and keep you and let his face shine upon you and let him be gracious unto you. Amen.